This is part one of a series on the RSA encryption algorithm, Intro to RSA. RSA cryptography is one of the most widely used types of cryptography in the world today. In this series, I'll be taking you through and explaining step by step the mathematics behind this cryptography and the algorithm. In this particular video, I'll be explaining a lot of the general background information behind RSA encryption. In later videos, I'll get more into the specifics of what I'm introducing right now, but for right now, I'm going to cover these four topics. Um, the number one simple assumption that RSA encryption is based off of, um, an introduction to the difference between asymmetric and symmetric key encryption, and how RSA being an asymmetric key encryption relates to its strength, an introduction to the variables and values involved in RSA, as well as an intro introduction to the public and private keys of RSA and the values that are included in each key. So let's get, start let's get started. First off, we're going to talk about the assumption that RSA encryption is based off of. It is that finding the factors of large semi-primes is difficult and time-consuming. So that's it. What keeps your bank account secure, your passwords, devices, all that is based on the assumption on this assumption that the founders of RSA encryption used to their advantage that has yet to be proven wrong. Now, dissecting this definition, let's get more into what each of these individual words mean in this assumption. Um, semi-primes, first of all, are simply numbers that are the product of two prime numbers. Prime numbers, in turn, are numbers that have no factors besides themselves and one. So an example of a prime number would be seven because it only has a factor of one and seven, factors of one and seven, as well as 11, which only has a factor, factors of one and 11. However, nine would not be a prime number because although it does have factors of one and nine, it also has the additional factor of three. Knowing that seven and 11 are prime numbers, we can say that seven times 11 equals 77. And we know that 77 is a semi-prime number because it's the product of what we know to be two prime numbers, seven and 11. Secondly, how large do I mean when I say large? I mean numbers that are about this length, hundreds of digits long. This number is called RSA 2048. It's a really huge semi-prime number that's pretty typical in RSA cryptography. This number was actually created as a challenge by the founders of RSA. Anyone who could find its factors would receive a large cash prize, but nobody has been able to do it yet. This brings me to my third point, that finding the factors of large semi-primes is time-consuming. Uh, exactly what do I mean by time-consuming? I mean thousands of years. This semi-prime that I showed you, RSA 2048, this number on a desktop computer using a brute force method would take literally a longer amount of time to factor than the universe has been in existence. Now, since RSA typically utilizes such huge semi-primes like this one and hides its factors from the general public, it would take a really, really long time for any hacker to try to find the factors of such a huge semi-prime, even with a powerful computer. This is a huge part of what makes RSA encryption so secure. In a later video, I'll show you like the mechanics of how factoring large semi-primes comes into play, but for now, it just suffices to understand this critical assumption that RSA is based off of, that finding the factors of large semi-primes is time-consuming. Now that we've covered the number one assumption that RSA encryption is based off of, I'll get into how the algorithm is characterized a little bit more. RSA was developed by three men in the 1970s, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman. It was new and revolutionary and, most of all, strong in that it was one of the first types of asymmetric key encryption. 
So what is the difference between asymmetric and symmetric key encryption? Well, the best way that I found to explain this is through an example that I found online a couple of months ago, and this is basically how it goes. So imagine that you have a box that has an important message in it that you'd like to send to your friend, but you don't want anybody but your friend to see the message inside the box, so you lock the box using a key, and then you send the locked box to your friend. Your friend then unlocks the box using the identical key that you used to lock your box. Now here, you and your friend had to have met beforehand so that you could determine what key you were going to use, or you would have had to have sent the identical key that you used to lock the box along to your friend with the box, which kind of defeats the purpose of encryption because the key can be easily intercepted. What I've just described is a simplified example of symmetric key encryption. Symmetric. Now consider a different scenario. In this case, your friend buys a padlock as well as a key that opens that padlock. He sends you the open padlock, but keeps the key. You then lock the box containing your secret message using the padlock that your friend sent you. You then send the locked box containing your secret message uh, back to your friend, who then unlocks it using the key that he's kept with him this entire time. Remember, he's able to do this because he was the one who purchased the padlock that you locked your box with, and he's the one who kept the key that unlocks the padlock. So this scenario, in which no keys are exchanged, describes asymmetric key encryption. Symmetric. In asymmetric key encryption, identical keys do not have to be shared between you and your friend, as they did in symmetric key encryption. Um, RSA encryption is an asymmetric key encryption that works a lot like the latter example I just described, making it exceedingly safe because no keys are exchanged that could potentially be intercepted. This is what makes asymmetric key encryption so strong, the fact that no keys are exchanged as they are in symmetric key encryption, the fact that your friend has kept the decryption key, the key that he'll use to unlock your the box lock the box with your secret message in it. He's kept that with him and he's kept it secret the entire time. Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman were able to develop a mathematical algorithm that would put the conceptual idea of asymmetric key encryption into action. This marked the beginning of RSA encryption. Now getting into some of the variables and values that the founders of RSA used in their algorithm. Throughout this series, you're going to hear me refer to six main letters, variables, that Rivis, Shamir, and Edelman used to represent different values in their algorithm. They are P, Q, N, Phi N, E, and D. Um, you'll also hear me refer to two hypothetical people called the key generator and the sender. So the key generator is the one who's going to generate the values for all six of these variables. And the sender is going to be the one who's going to select a message that he or she would like to send to the key generator and encrypt it. Then, after the sender has encrypted their message and sent it to the key generator, it'll be the key generator's job to decrypt this message. So how will the sender encrypt his or her message, and how will the key generator unlock the sender's encrypted message? Well, before I answer that question, let me first explain the concepts of the public and private keys in relation to RSA encryption. Now, the public key is comprised of the values of and and e. 
These two values will be released to the general public and are available to everyone. The private key, on the other hand, is comprised of the values of P, Q, Phi, N, and D. These four values will be kept private and will never be released to the general public. The sender, like everybody else, has access to the public key. This means that he or she has access to the values of N and E, obviously. They'll use these two values to encrypt their message. These two values of N and E are the ones that will be used by the sender to encrypt his or her message. I'll go more into the mechanics of exactly how they'll do this in a later video, but for now, it suffices to know that the sender encrypts a message using the values of N and E. The key generator, on the other hand, has access to all six values, since he or she is the one who in fact created the values for all six variables. However, the key generator will really only use the values of D and N to decrypt a message that's sent to him or her. The other values of the private key, such as P and Q, are the values that the key generator uses to create the rest of the values in either key. However, the key generator still can't release the values of the private key. Releasing these values would allow for easy interception. We'll see how in a later video. So, so far we've covered how RSA encryption, being an asymmetric key encryption, relates to its strength. We've also familiarized ourselves with the variables and values involved in RSA and where each one belongs, in the private key or in the public key. Um, we've seen that RSA strength is heavily dependent on the assumption that large semi-primes are difficult to factor. Um, so in the next few videos, we'll start to explore how the key generator will generate values of the public and private key. Thanks for listening!